The sun has gone down at Hangman's Hill and the ghost at Misery Corner isn't walking tonight. So, welcome to the Weird Tales Radio Show, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. And now, here's your host, writer, award-winning journalist, best-selling author and sometime werewolf hunter, Charles Christian. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Weird Tales Radio Show. I'm your host, Charles Christian, and thank you very much for tuning in again. This week we're back in the land of cryptozoology with an interview with Andy McGrath, the author of The Beasts of Britain, and a man who describes himself as being obsessed by the unknown creatures living right under our noses on a tiny island in the North Atlantic. It's a long interview, so rather than listen to me waffling on, let's get on with the show. Okay, and it's my pleasure now to be talking to Andrew McGrath, who's the author of The Beasts of Britain, and uh, it's also his website. And uh, he says he's been an enthusiast looking at the weird creatures of this country for 25 years or so. Tell us, tell us a bit more about how you got into it. Well, it's, a, I mean, it's a, a funny story to me, anyway. Um, I was working. Uh, well, for, first of all, I've always been into cryptids and unusual and unknown animals and mysteries since I was a teenager, forty-four now. And um, I, I was a singer, a semi-professional singer for a long time, and I worked in healthcare and primary care in central London, private primary care for eight or nine years, you know, 50 hours a week, three hour commute, that, that kind of turn around. Yep. And uh, I hit 40 in 2016 and I was just very bored. And my wife said, what about this monsters thing that you're always talking about? <laughs> and that's how she revisited. How about your monsters? Do, do something with that. And <laughs> I, um, I have similar conversations. Yeah, that exactly. That monsters thing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. She calls it that or my grown up boy hobby. Yes. Um, and which I think is very, very cute. And she's, you know, we've got a, a very good marriage. She's very happy for me to go off and do my thing as long as it doesn't concern her. And I have similar ideas about her interests. So it's a good balance. And um, so I, first of all, I thought, well, maybe I'll write a blog. And I'd also had a, a challenge from an American friend to prove there was more than just Nessie in the yes. UK, the Loch Ness Monster. And you know, I was kind of taking that up. And then I thought, well, maybe make it a TV series. And I tried to sell the idea to a friend at that time. And he said, oh, well, somebody should just steal it. Write a book first, and then it'll be protected. And so I thought about what the name could be. I thought, well, it's not Bigfoot. It's not Nessie. It's not really anything in particular. It's just about general creatures that may uh, anecdotally be reported to, to be in existence here. But, you know, we don't know. Ah, so Beasts of Britain just kind of popped out and I quickly made the pages and, you know, copyrighted it. <laughs> yes. And created the brand and I just started writing the book and telling everybody I was writing a book whilst releasing blogs that were going to end up as chapters. So there wasn't even a book. Mm. And people immediately started interviewing me from the US for some reason. I, think, I guess they thought it was interesting. Um, but I was just at the beginning. So I, I think I did about 30 interviews whilst writing the book, you know, along my route until it was published in 2017 and constantly talking about, well, this is what we're doing. This is what we found so far. Check out my new blog and so on and so forth. And it it just grew. Um, I had no intention at all of making it anything more than a grown up boy's hobby about monsters. And uh, it's being quite popular. I've done some speaking tours with it. I'm, I'm on the second book, Beast of North America at the moment, almost done, and have come close to selling the series once or twice, but it's not quite materialized. And uh, yeah, but but still may, you know, still involved in a few bits and pieces and documentaries. So yes, that's the background all jumbled up and mm-hmm. around the houses. But yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very intriguing and interesting weird hobby that's become somewhat serious in recent times. Hmm. Already mentioned there the um, the fact there are more things in this country than the, just the lake monsters and Nessie. Um, 
looking at the one of the illustrations you sent me of the sort of oh, yes. wall chart, if you like, uh, of, of, of yeah. it. I mean, demon dogs we know about because obviously we're bung- like bungy down yeah. here, so we've got yeah, shuck. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't move for for that. And it's all about you guys. Uh, the wood woes as well. I mean, um, mm. that crops up, and again, there's been sightings around in this part of the world relatively recently mystery big cats that's a one that runs and runs but there's things you've got on there that are some weird ones because you've got unidentified flying cryptids mm. you've got river monsters trolls is it and yeah little yeah. people and things like that so tell us a bit more about how did it evolve and how did your research progress well i i was sort of clearly searching through all of my old library and and uh, available books about the subject online, but also quite a hefty bit of online research and uh, plaguing fellow researchers, poor um, beguiled researchers in the UK <laughs> about everything that they could possibly tell me about these things. I mean, I had you know the book is uh, I point out at the beginning of the book it's not. A, a work of academia in any respect whatsoever. It does you know, seek to elucidate a few of the faux facts of the uh, of this type of I, I'm calling it modern folklore these days. So folklore yeah. that's happening in real time. Yeah. Um, and and yet they are still stories, you know, that have very little evidential basis. Um, so the thing with the the little people, very particular, or the, I, there's a chapter in the book. It's called the little people or the hairy fairy folk, and I got the idea about it from uh, a chat I'd had with Gary Opit in Australia. Now he's a, a zoologist and a botanist and a cryptozoologist there who's very knowledgeable about the local fauna and flora of Australia, but also the the cryptozoological uh, flora and fauna of Australia. And we talked about the Janjadi there, which is kind of like a miniature Bigfoot, something mm-hmm. we would refer to, you know, in, in olden times as a troll, I think, really. Right. Um, and I just started to think to myself, I wonder if some of these old fairy, and fairy in the, the broad sense of the, yes. the catch-all term, these, these fairy legends in the UK could have been based upon experiences with small, you know, diminutive um, cryptozoological Bigfoot or apes, I would refer to, to them as mm, personally myself, mm. and start looking at some of the old legends, you know, things uh, such as um, you know, gnomes, brownies, the hobgoblins, pixies, pucks, yes. uh, the knockers, the fenidry, the grugachs and the boobachs and trows especially, and just thought to myself, is there corroborative, are there corroborative stories that might fit this pattern around the world, like the Hulda folk? in uh, Iceland mm. and, yes. and other such places, the brownies and the filigrees. And it just seemed, yes, that they were, there does seem to be some sort of corroboration there. There are some recent-ish sightings of things that could be um, determined to be small, hairy beings in the UK, but they were few and far between, far fewer than somewhere like Australia or, or Iceland. I actually wondered if that was something to do with a drop-off in that kind of belief uh, in a general sense in the UK. Whereas, you know, as you know, in Iceland, you probably know quite well hmm. uh, some of the interesting subjects. They often, um, you know, divert motorways and roads around suspected holder folk homes out of yes. respect. And it, it, belief in fairies is it's common throughout even a, a, the administrative uh, side of the country. And uh, then again, on the Australian side, for, at least from an Aboriginal point of view, the Janjardi and, and other such beings um, are regularly cited and, and reported as just you know, another rare but well-known animal. So, yeah, I looked into it. Uh, one of that really stood out to me, uh, actually, uh, uh, with, with the two, the, with the trolls of Slitting Mill, that you mentioned, mm. uh, which was cited in 1975 by a young couple, uh, Barry and Elaine, returning from a Christmas party, um, Slitting Mill in Staffordshire. And of course, there's lots of creepy, spooky sort of elements and stories to do with Staffordshire. Aren't yes. So it seems to be a strange um, uh, section of the country. 
uh, about a car stalling. It is a well-known story. I think Nick Redfern and others had reported on in the past. Uh, their car had stalled, and the husband had jumped out to check the engine. And his wife witnessed a small figure run across the road in front of them, and then another and another. Um, she described them as hairy, troll-like creatures, um, little men with hunchbacks, big hook noses, not a stitch on, and just hair all over them, about four feet tall. Now, I thought that was very curious because that actually sat very, very well with the Jan um corroboration that I was looking for, you know, the old fairy corroboration of this this type of figure that could be an animal of some kind. Um there's another story from the 1980s in uh, Evesham um, of uh, a tiny weeping figure being uh, witnessed by a person walking home along a rural country-ish uh, kind of uh, road. Uh, the guy sees a strange small creature covered in hair, large-ish and bulky, standing beneath a, a lamppost, a streetlight, and to his astonishment, it seems to be the shoulders are moving, heaving as though it's it's sobbing, um, with its head covered, face covered, leaning against the lamppost, and he uh, he doesn't know what to do. Really, he just kind of skulks past on the other side of the street and um, tries to get out of the way, I guess. But his description was something sobbing in the way a you know a scolded child might do. Mm-hmm. Um, with its right arm upwards against its its forehead, and I, I thought that was quite fascinating. I mean, nineteen eighties is it's not so recent, but it's it's mm. not a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and the final one, I'll just just slip in there very quickly, not to labour the point, was allegedly taken on New Year's Day, uh, January twenty eighteen, when a a dog walker saw something very unusual in a place called. Errington Woods, uh, which is near the village of Newmask. And uh, she was walking through the woods and she heard some chattering noises and thought it sounded like two men muttering. Um, She looks into the trees in the direction of the sounds and sees two creatures stood near a felled tree, about three feet tall and covered in tawny colored hair. States that they were males based upon the anatomy that she saw. (laughs) And that they looked like small, primitive humans. One was wearing what she assumes was a loincloth. Um, each had a mane of hair down their necks. Very muscular. Uh, got the impression they weren't children, they weren't young, but they were fully grown. And uh, they stared at her for a few seconds ago. She, of course, reached for her phone and the dog starts barking and they run off into the bushes. Um, you know, as all of these classic stories end. So I think these are interesting things it's just to to point out with everything that we take you take the witness at their word unless you have real suspicion or a real reason not to and it's it's curious people are out there seeing things and and some people are very willing to, to talk about them this of course some of these stories predate the discovery in um Either Indonesia or was it of the the, oh, Hob- the hobbits? Yes, uh, you know yes, that, yes. that there does appear to have been a species of smaller primitive hominids, humans. Homo floresiensis. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, it's not a case of somebody being influenced by a new story and thinking, oh, it must be one of those hobbits type of things. It's it was it was all pre that. Yes, I mean, apart from the the last tale, uh, which was yes. twenty eighteen, but absolutely yes. And do you think there's a difference then between little people and trolls, or do you think that maybe there are several species of creature of a similar form? Because, you know, earlier on you were mentioning all the various names we have for them, Mm. you know, the hobs Mm. and the goblins and the fae and the like. Possibly it's not the same thing. There may well be a raft of different creatures. There may well be, and I think actually, if you think about it, the there's a few points in that. One, the the fairy label itself t- testifies to that raft of of different types of creatures that the fairy um, label and everything that that applies within that. Um, I 
think in this particular case, some of it is cultural. So some of the are very similarly described creatures, but of course, Britain has had many different natural cultures with different um, uh, languages and mm -hmm. different uh, myths and legends and laws. So, I mean, the Puck would be a really good example of that. Uh, puck in England is a, it's a puka mm. in Ireland and Wales, only it's spelled a different way, but it's the characteristics in all three places are very, very similar. Yeah. Uh, only the word has changed. Um, in some other respects, actually, I just, you know, I wonder, you know, I just wonder if there's so much myth and legend wrapped up with these things. And of course, we, in this country, we are, well, we I would say six, but we're the four primary distinct nations, aren't we? Yes. Six, if you really count the, the, the others as, as the Manx and the Cornish yes. as well. And there's many variations in between. And we ourselves have migrated long ago from parts of Europe and carry that European ancestry with us and share so many, um, so many similar myths and legends to one another that we then exported out to North America and Australia and all these other places mm. uh, that we colonized who also display a, a distinct, similar characteristic of mysterious beings as, as we mm. do. So there's something to be said for um, uh, subconsciously the, um, the cultural beliefs just carry out. They spread out with the culture itself and they disseminate throughout that culture in a, in a sort of watered down way uh, to, to the point where people maybe with things like the dog man myth in America, people in the, an urban legend kind of way don't really even understand where they could have got the interest in such a creature. And yet it's been there in their ancestry and their DNA for thousands of years um, as to where their, their family came from. Mm. That's one aspect on it. The other aspect, of course, is that if there are types of creatures around the world of a similar genus that have variations in them and are spread throughout the world, like Bigfoot or Yeti or Yerin or Yowie or Woodwose or uh, any of the variation Sasquatch that you have of this particular you know, hidden ape, it seems to testify to be a, a, a genus, a type of creature uh, whose variations are perhaps just as different as you know, polar bear, grizzly bear, brown bear, black bear, moon bear, sun bear, panda, all mm. bears, mm. and yet distinct from one another in their appearance. So that's where I am on it. There definitely seems to be some uh, some smoke, and I, I'm sure that will lead to a fire one day. But uh, as to who's going to discover it, <laughs> yes, <laughs> anyone's guess. Have you had any encounters in your research? Seen anything? Sea monsters, lake monsters, big cats, things like that. No, I mean the sad answer to that actually <laughs> is no. Um, I mean I had a what one of the big peaks with the big cat thing and my interest actually came from an experience I missed in 1999 around between Christmas and New Year mm -hmm. uh, an ex-girlfriend her family had a house in a place called Krimach in West Wales near the foot of the Priscilla Mountains miles away I mean it, they were in a small village which yeah. I think meant that the closest house was five miles away Yes, and um, in a lovely house with a big patio and just fields stretching on and a bunch of people are from London mums of her mum's friends and one of them was a heavy smoker and she'd gone out in the early hours of the morning to have a yeah. cigarette lit the cigarette and literally saw this panther black panther leopard I'm assuming staring at her in the light of a flame 10 15 feet away and and it watched her for a few seconds and turned and, and walked away and that next day we I mean we yeah, there was snow everywhere. We actually went on a huge hike looking for dens and all kinds of things, which was a really stupid idea. But <laughs> <laughs> at the time, we were enamored. And I think when something's out of context, you would never go searching for a leopard in India or uh, anywhere else mm. where they would naturally be found. But in the UK, of course, surely it's not harmful <laughs> since it's out of place. And we went, we didn't find it, thankfully. And um, that was kind of started everything for me. But that near miss has always really stuck with me. There's a second near miss, actually. So um, for our honeymoon, my very understanding wife allowed us to go to Loch Ness. Loch Ness. <laughs> and um, 
we stayed at the Loch Ness Lodge, which is this five star really plush hotel. So that was the part of the, the yes. dice that, yes, we can go to Loch Ness, but it has to be still it has to be special. And um, the dining room there overlooked the Loch near Drumna Drochet. And we, I was staring, you know, it was my first time to, there and I was staring constantly at the water the whole time. And nothing happened. It often happens. I've been in Loch Ness quite a few times now and nothing ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we left. And two years later, there was a report on the Loch Ness sightings register run by Gary Campbell of nine people in the dining room of the Loch Ness Lodge witnessed a large boat-shaped hump surface in the water near the hotel and swim around for a couple of minutes. I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> If we could only have been married yes. years later, <laughs> <laughs> then that would have been perfect. So no, never have had any experiences. Had some spooky experiences in the woods, but it, it, I think it's if you go out in the woods with the intention of seeking something, then and you're there by yourself, which I I always used to be in the early days. I didn't used to go with anybody. At night times as well, sometimes you start to get a little freaked out. You do, you do. Yeah. Remember, we were out one evening in the autumn taking our dogs for a walk to a nearby wood and this thick fog came down ah. and it was cold and dense and it was really one of those moments where you think, I'm not going to look behind me in case there's some foul feeling <laughs> creeping up on me but it was that really sort of shivers down your <laughs> back i'm sure it must be a natural instinct we have uh yeah. of a, a sort of a, a vulnerability to predators yes when you can't see when your your sight or your senses are affected yes that's great predator time yes <laughs> yes yeah yes the sort of primitive ape brain kicks in mm. that uh we stick outside the cave um mm. There's a saber tooth waiting for us, or a bear, or something yes. very, very natural that can a badger even. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I saw one, I'd run. Those are vicious creatures, um, a badger or a boar. Um, yes. Yeah. So I love like this whole thing. I've, I'm one of these types of researchers actually that seems to come up with a concept or an idea, find some. Uh, supporting documentation and I spend the rest of the time trying, trying to debunk myself and <laughs> it's very frustrating and um, yeah, I have come into some criticism because of it because essentially I think my my outspoken verbal criticism of the genre is, is generally directed towards myself and that's perceived as being um, a tantamount to sacrilege in some circles because there is a, a level of belief mm. that's, um, that's involved in in cryptological circles and this weird crossover into paranormal that we have. Yes. The two seem to match, uh, uh, hit, you know, um, fit together, uh, not well, but um, seamlessly sometimes. Yes. And it's it's odd. And I, I've been questioning a lot recently these things that we talked about. What are the, you know, um, just to, to make up a phrase, that, uh, the socio-religious um uh, subliminal undercurrents that affect all of us. Uh, do we project sometimes? Do we project uh, our desires onto the things that we want to see? And one of the points I made to somebody, uh, there were two, somebody asked me recently, um, uh, this documentary with Christopher Turner um, called Sticks and Stones about the stick signs everybody attributes to Bigfoot and posts on all of these websites. And I started joking that we should start calling ourselves the Wicker Men. <laughs> because and people didn't like that but the point was is that it should only really be corroborative evidence of something if we find out that evidence like you know tracks and hair and fecal matter or there's been a sighting at that very point where you find these stick structures and uh, when we went to Scotland to Galloway Forest Park and did this documentary there was this massive absence of the stick sign and we noticed also a uh, uh, there was no absence of things like midges and ticks and uh, moss and sodden ground and just unpleasant habitat. Um, and nobody was up there bushcrafting or camping out. And we thought, well, you know, this, the human absence seems to be the indicator as to why there is no stick signs. There are no stick signs. 
and uh, you know, it was it's not conclusive, but it, at least it was it was a bit of a hit into that community to say these sticks that you're posting, you know, this is your feeder pill. You have to get rid of this <laughs> addiction to them uh, in order to maintain credibility from an outside point of view. And uh, it wasn't very, you know, it wasn't very liked. And, um, somebody said to me, look, how can you deny the paranormal aspect of this Bigfoot creature? And I said, because when reports first started coming in of, you know, a horse with a, a giraffe-like uh, head and zebra legs, living on the outskirts of the Congo rainforest, I didn't assume that perhaps they could jump into portals or mind speak to me or teleport or you know, picked up by an alien spaceship and dropped it in another location or whatever people want to say they are. That, that was never part of the equation. Nobody's ever asked, um, could the Kraken or the giant squid, as that probably turned out to be, mind speak to you or could it disappear in the blink of an eye? Or was it perhaps a ghost of some kind? It seems like a ridiculous question because we know that those are animals. Mm, and mm. to apply that question to this hidden animal question too seems a little a little strange yeah. for something that has been witnessed hunting and seems to need to live near water sources where there's lots of food around, forest cover, ghosts and paranormal entities. As yes. far as my limited information goes, don't <laughs> seem to require those types of uh, environments for their survival. You're listening to the Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian. Let's talk about some of the creatures you identified or reported in and around the British Isles. The river monsters. There's a intriguing picture up there oh, yes. on the map of a square cubic like thing with a yes. octopus or a <laughs> yes. jellyfish type tendrils coming yeah. from it. Yeah. This was actually this was very intriguing when I when I had this it actually came almost at the beginning of me starting this blog. And because the the chap uh, and his brother who witnessed this creature seem to describe both squid-like and jellyfish-like um, attributes. I thought, well, just call it the jelly squid. Yes. And it took place at London Bridge, um, which is, you know, it's a very, very busy um, bridge in London. It, it's really, apart from now, it's really ever, ever quiet. And this was in April 2014. Uh, these two brothers, they were crossing the, the, the crossing London Bridge over the River Thames, mm -hmm. and they describe seeing a creature with a grayish, featureless, slightly elongated square head with um, what looked like lots of green tentacles or, or tassels at the bottom, around five feet long. They said it was as thick as a man's body. Uh, it was sighted to the left of the bridge, and the surface of the water, and it was swimming against the current. Always a, a good sign for something being a, uh, at least animate. Yes. Um, after about one minute of submerging, it's the first uh, surface thing. They, they they finally lost sight of it. And uh, one of the brothers described something like, it felt that it had a metallic mechanical feel to it, but it said it was definitely a biological creature. I wonder if that was something to do with the color that it had. Mm -hmm. They tried try to take photos with their camera phones and they said the quality was, was too poor. Now, the little blog I've got, my Beast of Britain blog, actually, there's, there's actually... There's a sketch and there's a, a little clip of the witness describing what they saw and exactly what they saw in relation to the bridge. You know, I, I thought, wow, could this be you know, a bell jellyfish, a jellyfish or a box jellyfish or something like that? Perhaps lots of maybe it got in an oil slick or it was, mm. I don't know, just injured and washed up the river. Lots of things do end up in the River Thames. I and mean, yes. we've had uh, three or four whale strandings in the River Thames just this year. Hmm. Um, one of them was a say whale. I mean, this uh, uh, it's it's becoming a busy waterway for um, yes. you know, quite rare animals. And of course, there was Benny the beluga whale that was there in the, um, the deeper part in the Gravesend just the year before. So could it be mistaken identity? Yeah, these guys are not in an uh, marine biologist, they could have mistaken something, but then the creature they described seemed so unusual. I thought it, it deserved a bit of a look, hmm. but nothing like that has ever been seen since. 
uh, in the River Thames. So a one-off, let's, mm. let's put it that way. But you know, clearly very, very uh, disconcerting to the guys who saw it. I did try to get to interview them, actually, um, shortly after that London Bridge attack. That right. happened. Uh, yeah, and they didn't want to go to the location. But yeah. that's the you know, that's the crux with, with something like this. Unlike our American counterparts, most British witnesses, they don't want the ridicule. They don't, and it's, it's open ridicule, but you're a bit strange, aren't you? Yeah. When you've seen something and yeah. getting people to go on record, even anonymously, is very, very difficult if it's going to be recorded. Very difficult. What about the flying creatures now? Particularly interesting in this is um, on my social media links, people are posting up one of the reserves in... Um, either Essex or Suffolk, they've been sighted in the last couple of days, some uh, sea eagles flying over there, oh, white-tailed oh, yeah. eagles. Yeah. And there's some video clips and showing them, and you can see uh, red kites as well, which are big, but then these eagles are just enormous. You know, we are now starting to get big birds of prey, mm. raptors being seen increasingly and Certainly, well, I think the sea eagles are back, as far as I'm aware, aren't they? In, in mm. small numbers, anyway. Yes. And you just wonder whether yeah. some of these un unidentified flying creatures are actually unrecognised big natural birds. What's what's your take on it? I think it's that's a reasonable it's a reasonable line of um, inquiry, really, because um, let's face it, you know, what you'd have to think most regularly is what's more likely that I've just seen a, a prehistoric survivor over the skies of Shropshire or in the Air Valley, or I've seen a, uh, a bird not regularly seen or not native to these shores passing through hmm. on its way to somewhere else. And I think that's qu quite likely. Um, there are one or two of these sightings um, that, that seem to be hard to, um, to distinguish, uh, I mean, to to uh, dismiss. Mm -hmm. One of them is, uh, I, I called it the book, The Screeching Serpents of Shropshire. And actually the sighting was passed to me by a, a researcher that uh, particularly looks at these kinds of sightings. And he had a, um, 2017, he had a, a report come through from a lady who lived in Whitchurch in Shropshire. And mm -hmm. She'd seen, she said two pterosaurs flying through an area um, called Whitchurch, in it. and she claimed that she was alerted to the presence of the creatures by a strange screech. Didn't sound like anything she'd heard before. She said that initially after hearing the strange screech, she became aware that the sound was coming closer to her from across the way, behind some trees. She was shocked to see two pterodactyls flying side by side. They passed the trees and flew off fast until she lost sight of them in the clearing between some woodland houses. Described them as being much bigger than the biggest heron she'd ever seen. Which lar with large beaks and leathery wings. They're both grey in colour. Uh, and some days later, her 13 year old son came running in from the garden to claim he'd witnessed something similar a bird with bat like wings that made a strange screeching sound, uh, which she confirmed by showing him a, a picture of a pterosaur. Now, that's odd. There's a few things that are odd about it, the, the sighting. What's not included in this particular sighting in the book is that they were actually seen flying across a a bird reserve. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's for one that that indicates they could have been some kind of exotic bird. Mm -hmm. Two, the leathery wings is strange. I mean, there's not really much room for mistaking a heron or anything else for having leathery wings. Yes, yes. So that that does pique my interest. Again, she could have been mistaken. They could have just been a very opaque grey colour, mm. perhaps. Um, uh, maybe the feathers are visible when something's flying. I think that's one of the most difficult um, uh, identifications to make. It's moving fast. It's above you. It's high above you. Mm. Often shadowed, I suppose, yes. if the sun's above it. So, so what are you looking at? I mean, a frigate bird is a great example of that, right? Um, they have that split tail that tends to look kind of like legs or, or sometimes like a, a long pterosaur like tails sticking out of the back of the bird the wings have almost like the strange 
bat-like arch, although we know that mm-hmm. Paris doesn't really look like that so much. Um, so yeah, lots of frigate birds online masquerading as, as pterosaurs. <laughs> Perhaps she saw something like that, but I mean, they would be very, very out of place in Shropshire. What about your other unidentified flying cryptids? There's, okay. a, there's a little creature on your map that, mm. if I was going to be cruel, looks a bit like a, a uh, headless chicken. <laughs> uh, 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 the, yeah, it does. So that that's um, that's the bat beast of Kent. This again is a it's a very well known sighting, uh, not not one that's been uh, uh, directly passed to me. Uh, this was in November 1963. Uh, four teenage friends walking home from a party in the county of Kent, and they saw a mysterious flickering light descend into a nearby field in Sanding Park. Uh, they saw the light make its way into some trees at the park, and, and the four teens noticed a rustling in the brush, and they were shocked at when a figure emerged, waddled towards them. They described the creature um, looking like a bipedal, headless bat, around five feet tall with big red feet and wings on its back. One of the witnesses was convinced that it didn't have a head. Now, there's some strange parallels with the Mothman, actually, mm. and this particular creature, often with the, the eyes being, seeming to be set within the chest or the creature seeming not to have a, a perceptible head uh, 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 separate to its body. So I think that, that I mean, this is pre-Mothman sighting as far as I know, so 1963. So that would be a, hmm. that's a, a curious, you know, a curious creature. There are other very strange um, uh, creatures of Batman of Sight Hill Cemetery, Glasgow. Um, there's a, a cemetery, Sight Hill Cemetery in Glasgow and 4.30 a.m. one morning uh, a driver returning home I'm guessing they were working the night shift or something like that um, pulled over to perform a U-turn only to be startled by something suddenly running out of Sight Hill Cemetery gates said so the thing moved extremely quickly past the guidelines, shot off down the street at immense speed witness described it as a bipedal man like um shape, jet black in color, with what might have been bat wings or a heavy cowl. Um, he drove after it 40 miles per hour, but was unable to catch up with it. Seemed very athletic and strong. Then he spotted it again on the pavement on the left-hand side of the road, about 200 yards ahead, stood still. He said it looked like a man wearing a heavy cowl. As he drove towards it, suddenly jumped vertically up in the air and cleared a 20-foot fence in a single movement. Now that, to me, seems like something that would almost fall into the paranormal Hmm. uh, side of things for want of explanation. Yes. Yeah. Um, Those descriptions actually sound a bit like the Victorian era Spring Heel Jack, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what I would normally think when investigating something like that is, is this something fabricated and heavily influenced by Spring Heel Jack? It might be, it might be a good source to use to fake a sighting, as it's very old. It might mm. not be easily referenced. Um, or is there a similar creature in another part of the country that's rarely seen? I don't know. Um, I find it hard. I mean, if we're talking about living pterosaurs and things, I find it hard to attribute a sighting like that to one of those running. 40 miles per hour down the street bipedally and then leaping over a fence it doesn't seem like very pterosaur like behavior mm. as far as we assume them to move anyway yes yeah mm. Mm. so what i'm always looking for natural explanations but the issue is is that there aren't any but that doesn't immediately make me jump to the paranormal yes i just think well but just don't have an explanation for what what they say uh, is describing that they saw. Yes, That's a, it's a bit the same argument, isn't it? That crops up with ancient technologies. That yes, we don't aliens. know how they <laughs> exactly. We don't know how they did it, but that just simply means the skills have been lost. Or yes, uh, it doesn't mean it was aliens that did it. And well, um, this country, when the Romans left, we were so far behind where we were for hundreds of years after they left. Mm. You know, they basically took the technology with them and we didn't know how to 
replicate yes. it or we didn't have the administrative expertise to to run the country that in the mm. way that they ran it yes yes you, you wonder what the saxons would have made of the underfloor heating systems exactly. that roman villas had <laughs> <laughs> never mind being unable to replicate the technology but uh, oh yeah i definitely or oh, I, I concrete that sets in the water i mean that's fantastic yes yeah absolutely mm, mm. what are your current projects other than obviously we're in lockdown um at the time we're doing this interview what are your sort of plans for the future? You've mentioned you're working on another book, but um, yes, the beasts of North America. How are you doing the research on that? Is that from sort of collecting reports and data and the like? It, 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 some of it is. I mean, much of it is, of, of course, um, and then much of it is because I thankfully made so many researcher contacts in that part of the world. Some of it's been directly handed to me as the sightings from some of those researchers and witnesses are getting in touch as well. Now, the, the content is quite top secret. I've just sort of put some blogs out about it tonight, very basic ones to, to start that up again in the same way as I did with Peace of Britain. But it's geographical North America. It's not just the USA or Canada. It's it's also Greenland and Mexico and it, it, all the you know all the countries and islands in between. So yeah. yeah, it's um I just wanted it to be just a little bit more um what's the word I catch him because we all think about North America. I mean uh, the USA whenever we think of North America. Mm. Same way as if you say Britain, you think England straight away yes. if you're a foreigner. Yeah, you don't think I'm going. To Britain, Wales, and Britain, Scotland, you think it's England, yes. for, for better or worse. Um, yeah, so I think I would just, I would just like to get a really good, really in-depth telling, not too long, maybe something about, because it's a lot of countries to cover, maybe something around about 400 pages, um, but in short excerpts and, and very direct um, segments on each creature in each country in each section and I overlay bring the point I want to do on occasion and um, <laughs> uh, what does my wife call it you know Hugh Grant uh, waffle talk <laughs> 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 um, I think it's just a British thing isn't it and um, yeah just something that that flows anyway it's it's all there it's all coming ahead but I'm just I'm, Anybody listening, I'm collecting more and more and more sightings, um, especially if they're sightings of well-known creatures that have been reported in the USA section. I'm looking for unreported sightings of that type of animal or in that type of area. And I've got a few. But, um, of course, um, you know, if you go off searching for your own white whale, uh, cryptozoologically speaking, in, in the USA for instance, um, you know, don't be surprised if you find traces of the many you know, happy harpoons that have been thrown before your time yes. <laughs> into that same creature, which um, that's what I'm mainly struggling with. Not not plagiarizing, not overworking a point that's already been quite clearly made by, actually at this point, many hundreds of researchers. Yes, finding something novel to say rather than just repeating what's already... Yes. That's, mm. uh, that's been the struggle. Yeah. Oh, and documentaries. Yes. Documentaries. Uh, heading back up to Loch Ness and, and Loch Morar, um in, well, as soon as we can, me and Christopher Turner will be heading back up there to make a little mini documentary again. Um, not so critical this time. More of an investigation on the routes to the sea, um, east and west, and the connecting lochs. Um, a lot of people don't really know much about that. Loch Ness has many connecting lochs. Yes. And uh, there are some sightings in some of those. And hopefully, you know, a, a well equipped, if we can get the equipment, night investigation of Loch Morar, you know, boats and sonar and um, flares, night fishing goggles, and, and the whole bit, basically, just stake out a few, uh, a few um, well, uh, well witnessed locales and see if we can come up with something. Which I'm not saying we will, but uh, <laughs> you might just see a lot of film footage of us in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting. Yes, a little <laughs> touch of the Blair Witch, almost. Yes. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, it's um, it's worse than fishing. 
hunting for like <laughs> monsters. At least you catch fish. And talking of fish, you've got sea serpents on your list. Mm. I mean, that's always a fascinating one because, you know, people see something in the distance and then it's gone. So it's very hard to oh, yes. verify, doesn't come back round again. You've got distance, you've got the perspective and size and things. Uh, I wrote a book about some of the folklore of East Yorkshire and ah. there's various sightings of sea serpents off Filey Brig and off Flamborough yes. Head and things like that. I, I think I included one of the Filey Brig sightings in the book, actually, yes. or in, at least in the listings at the mm. back. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd love to talk to you about that. It's um, there's You probably were of Paul Harrison's book, um, sea serpents and late monsters of the British Isles. Mm -hmm. uh, published 2001, so it's you know it's not exactly current anymore. But it, it was a very very decent appraisal of you know, these sightings, these legends in in the UK up until that point. Um, I think that part of the coast there's something uh, both east and west. Uh, that little slender part of the country, something about currents something there just seems to be very productive mm. um and and both east and west have lots of sightings but of course again even the strange thing about british people is that we live on an island but um not many of us are seafarers we, we don't actually spend a lot of time in the sea as, mm. as a nation mm. um and it's strange and i think we're still quite unused to some of the natural animals that that traverse our waters some of the, the cetaceans uh, whales and dolphins and all types of things that may be um, hanging about that we just we yes. don't we, we attribute to being in other places i was going to say yes we think they're so exotic that they mm. don't hang around the british isles yes yeah exactly that and actually there are lots of um exotic animals that hang around the um the british isles i was just going to say when i was i've uh, been down to the uh the Thames Estuary, so there's a whole population of seals living down there. And I just thought, I wonder how many people have mistaken one of these. You know, how many unfamiliar folk, in an odd circumstance, have mistaken one of these guys. They've got quite an elongate neck, grey seals. It doesn't quite make the grade every time, but there must be a fair amount of sightings that are just uh, made by people not expecting to see perhaps a seal in a lake, for instance. Lot Murray, that's tends to be forgotten about, but there's some quite old historical sightings, aren't they, there? I seem to mm. recall of one of the Scottish saints or something seeing a, a creature there. Not in Loch Moore, I don't believe. That, that's uh, in the River Ness, there was St. Columba. Right. Oh. The, um, yes, he had the, the uh, incident with the Loch Ness monster at that point um, in the River Ness when, I, by all accounts, a man had been savaged in the in the river and by some beast, and he'd sent in another man <laughs> to the water. <laughs> it's unclear, really. There's different sort of accounts of it, and then the beast had made another appearance, and he'd you know, beaten it back, with the sign of the cross and a, and a prayer, and it did not attack the man. Um, since there are no recorded, apart from that one incident um, in Loch Ness, at least there's lots of kelpies and uh, water horse yes legendary attacks you know throughout the area um it's just it's it's hard to say it's just hard to say i, I think saints were always banishing some serpent or <laughs> other weren't they yeah in the old days if you hadn't banished a serpent of some kind yeah. it weren't really worth your salt exactly yes yeah and um it, traditionally as in those days everything was always recounted 100 to 200 years later mm. um, in print. Now, it's regarding Loch Mora, however, um, one of my favorite sightings of this particular beastie, very, very clear sighting, um, was, I mean, how can I describe this? If this happened to to me, I think I would, and, and I want to see the creature, I think I would be very unnerved. Um, this was made by Robert Duffer, a joiner from Edinburgh, and he had, I think, the clearest sighting of the animal, uh, 8th of July, 1969. He's fishing from a boat in Mobley Bay on the southern shore of Loch Morar. The water is no more than 16 feet deep, 
and unlikeliness, it's crystal clear. Right, yeah. So what he spotted was a monster lizard lying motionless on Locke's white leaf strip bottom, looking up at him. Estimates the creature to be 20 feet long with a snake-like earless head, slit eyes and a white mouth. Its body was grey-brown with rough skin, had four limbs with three toes visible at each front foot, plus a tail. He was so unnerved by the creature that he left the area immediately, and I think we can forgive him for that. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he did go back later, apparently, to the same spot just to find that the animal had disappeared. Um, and then, of course, there was the the very famous dramatic five-minute confrontation with the creature that was experienced a month later, 16th of August, 1969, by Duncan McDonald and William Simpson. At about 9.30 p.m., their motorboat is traveling along the lock, and uh, suddenly they see a creature in the water about 20 yards behind them heading directly for the boat. A few seconds later, it collides at the side of the boat, McDonald attempts to fend the beast away with an oar, uh, frightens it's going to capsize them. The oar snaps in half because it's old, and Simpson then picks up his rifle and shoots the creature and slowly sinks back into the loch. Um, they estimate the two men that the portion of the creature they observed was 25 to 30 feet long with rough, dirty brown skin, tree humps or undulations, and that the head was brown snake-like, uh, measuring one foot across. Uh, and it was raised... The, the creature was raised about 18 inches out of the water. Um, there's a quote even where he says, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a large monster, maybe more than one in Loch Mora. Now, of course, these, this is hearsay, but it's odd. And I'm sure these men probably weren't aware of each other's sightings, these two separate sightings. Mm. Now, when we hear about Duff leaving the area, when he sees the creature lying on the bottom of the, the loch, it's clearly a good move that he makes because the next men who see it would like to get attacked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and at least they have a motorboat, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and they possibly kill it. So. <laughs> possibly. I mean, possibly. It's, it's hard to say. Let, let's hope not. But um, I love those sightings. Uh, but there's, there's others. There's uh, Lynn, Lynn Teggett in North Wales, uh, or Lake Bala, if you like, has uh, Teggy, the beast of Bala Lake. There's Lake Windermere has Bonessie or the Beast of Basson's Wake Lakes in, in the Lake District. And uh, there's all kinds of sea serpent and lake mon monster legends in the UK. They would pro proliferate even in modern times. But it's it's such a hard creature to to investigate. Something that lives beneath the water. I do, um, uh, a good friend of mine, lake monster researcher Scott Modis, he talks about um, a theory that perhaps if there are surviving plesiosaurs that they could have um, an ability to breathe underwater similarly to some turtles do uh, uh, something called um, cloacal respiration which is essentially um, air sacs in mm -hmm. the orifice of the turtles that allow it to, to turn uh, uh, try, uh, extract oxygen from water and you know, remain submerged for three to four days um, and there is some uh, so, so biological evidence, so anatomical evidence to show that the, the pelvic area the, the, could, on a pleasure saw, could possibly accommodate uh, the, this. Well, it's a bit of a stretch, but it could possibly <laughs> accommodate this, uh, this particular um, uh, uh, clinical uh, bird's eye. But who knows? I mean, these are all just theories. What's your favourite of various legends you've encountered? Really hard to say, actually. I, I mean, like anybody of my age growing up, I mean, it's hard to break that messy mm. session because that's what we've all been raised upon, right? Yeah. I, actually, there was, there was one that I, I really, really do like, and it's the, um, it's the, uh, it's the Firth of Tay monster, now the Firth of Tay, it, it's um, it would, it would Tayport Harbour, and, and and the Firth of Tay is sort of right on the very far east of Scotland. There, you could say it's it's almost you know, directly above uh, the Moray Firth there, where, where Loch Ness eventually yes releases itself back out into the sea. So there have been many sightings, there, including a film sighting in in 2015 uh, in and around that area. But there's one particular sighting um, that took place on land, which is it's really fantastic. And 
it's because the, the description of the beast really reminds me of Bernard Hoofelman's many humped variety of sea monster that I really like. And being a Hoofelman's fan and then finding a sighting like that hmm. really pleased me to say, well, wow, you know, maybe this is some sort of a corroboration of that. So this sighting happened on the 30th of September, 1965. There were two separate witnesses that saw it one and a half hours apart and they saw it on land. Uh, the first sighting was made by Maureen Ford, who's driving some, some friends along the A85 towards Perth in northeastern Scotland. Um, at 11.30 p.m., Maureen suddenly noticed a strange creature by the roadside a few yards from the banks of the River Tay. She said it was a long grey shape, had no legs, but I'm sure I saw long pointed ears. And then it was seen again one and a half hours later at 1 a.m. on the opposite side of the same road by Robert Swanky. He was driving along the A85 away from Perth towards Dundee. He caught sight of the creature in his headlights. He said the head was more than two feet long, seemed to have pointed ears. The body, which was about 20 feet long, was humped like a giant caterpillar. It was moving very slowly and made a noise like someone dragging a heavy weight through the grass, which is amazing. This is essentially, you know, an unknown animal. I mean, this is a, a pleasure sort like creature. It doesn't sound like. It sounds like a elongate, snake-like creature of some kind, but one they can take to land. It's uh, and it does corroborate many sea serpent reports, but it stretches the imagination as to what what gene is of of or what variety of animal it could be. Oh, fascinating! Well, that's super. Well, Andy, thank you ever so much for your time. Thank you so much. A real pleasure to talk to you, by the way. And you take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. And that's it. We're totally out of time. Once again, a big thank you to our guest, Andy McGrath. Uh, you can find him on all the usual social media channels, but the best starting place is his website, beastsofbritain.com. Next week, we're off into the realms of high strangeness in an interview with American MUFON investigator and paranormal researcher Preston Dennett. Now, it just remains for me to say, this is Charles Christian saying... Until the next time we're together, stay well, stay weird, stay different. Black Shuck, the demon dog of East Anglia, is baying at the moon. Which means it's time for us to go. You've been listening to The Weird Tales radio show with Charles Christian, your weekly fix of ghost stories, urban myths, witchcraft, magic and folklore. You can keep in touch with us online at www.weirdtalesradio.com by email to weirdtales at icloud.com and on Twitter at Christian Uncut. Join us again next week for another edition of the Weird Tales radio show. Good night. <laughs>